Hello once again from the Prim Reaper. I was really pleased to see the positive responses to dissecting and challenging the APA guidelines for men and boys in the last video. I really worried that this project was going to be too dry and boring for people, but the enthusiasm was very encouraging. That said, I'll try and be reasonably thorough in going through the actual guidelines bit, though you have to understand there's a fair amount of repetition of various points and themes. I'll try not to double up too much as I go through it all. That said, let's get to it. Guideline 1. Psychologists strive to recognize that masculinities are constructed based on social, cultural, and contextual norms. Rationale. Clinician awareness of one's stereotypes and biases against boys and men is a critical dimension of multicultural competence. Understanding the socially constructed nature of masculinity and how it affects boys and men, as well as psychologists, is also an important cultural competency. I have talked before about the idea of social constructs, and many of those points apply here. But what I want to say in particular is that I find it interesting the idea that this first guideline focuses on the social, cultural, and contextual norms that underlie the concept of masculinity without any acknowledgement that masculinity is in any way biologically constructed. While I'm not denying that social and cultural factors certainly contribute to the makeup of one's personality and experience of the world, we are remiss if we don't acknowledge that the biological factors, including those that are sex-linked, make up a significant aspect of an individual's experiences. These biological differences are many, and in the field of psychology they may range from relatively minor, but still notable, details, such as men being less likely to cry not just because they are socially shunned from doing so, but rather having larger tear ducts, less of the hormone prolactin which is associated with emotions, and more of the hormone testosterone which also inhibits crying to more significant differences, such as males being more likely than females to develop certain relevant mental health problems, such as autism spectrum disorder or ADHD. To minimize the effect of biological factors on the way men experience their masculinity and mental health is to miss a large piece of the puzzle in learning to effectively treat men. Or, for that matter, in challenging those biases you claim to be so concerned about. But speaking of biases, oh look! In Western culture, the dominant ideal of masculinity has moved from an upper-class aristocratic image to a more rugged and self-sufficient ideal. Thus, traditional masculinity ideology can be viewed as the dominant, referred to as hegemonic, form of masculinity that strongly influences what members of a culture take to be normative. Okay, so just briefly, I'm pretty sure the dominant ideal of masculinity is going to vary significantly depending on which social group you ask, especially in Western culture, which is characterized by a high tolerance for deviation from behavioral norms in general. I'm sure that if you ask a group of men in a university chess club in New York, a group of men in a gay bar in Washington, a group of men on a construction site in Texas, and a group of farmers from Saskatchewan about their ideal masculine image, you'll likely see a lot of variety in the most important points mentioned regarding masculinity. This is, of course, assuming any of these groups talk much about the subject to begin with, to be honest with you, it's not really a conversation I've had with any man, client or otherwise, in any kind of organic manner that doesn't just involve my directly asking them for their thoughts on masculinity as a concept. Either way, it's really not so simple as they're presenting it here. Prescriptions and proscriptions for behaviors that either align with or contradict the dominant ideal of masculinity are not linear, uniform, or without resistance. <laughs> Many men are socialized by friends, mimicking behaviors and interests, family, imitating parent and sibling behaviors, peers, conforming to group social norms to avoid ostracism, and society, adhering to media portrayals of gender conformity to adopt traditional masculine ideals, behaviors, and attitudes. Again, lingering on the socializing aspect. 
I would also like to mention here that it's a bit odd to focus so much on this element, as if everyone isn't socialized in many different ways by all of these groups. It's not like this is just some odd, insidious process that happens to men with masculinity. You could make this claim regarding many different things. Many people are socialized by friends, family, society, etc. to go to higher education, to get a standard 9-to-5 job, to have children. This is not some kind of profound experience that affects men and masculinity exclusively. Yet, for some men, this dominant ideology of masculinity has inherent conflicts. For instance, dominant masculinity was historically predicated on the exclusion of men who were not white, heterosexual, cisgender, able-bodied, and privileged. Good god, these guys talk about masculinity like it's some kind of weird social club. I'm not saying there aren't some out there who haven't engaged in discriminatory behaviors or made disparaging comments towards people of varying minority statuses, but I feel like calling people racist or homophobic comments, wrong as those things are, is a little bit different than making the claim that people are not masculine. Also, somehow I doubt that many disabled or homeless individuals would complain about threats of masculinity as being within even the top 10 insults they have sustained within the past decade, but I could be wrong. They continue on about diverse categories like this a lot in some bizarre ways over the next little bit. Here are some choice examples. Men who depart from this narrow masculine conception by any dimension of diversity – race, sexual orientation, gender identity, and gender expression – may find themselves negotiating between adopting dominant ideals that exclude them or being stereotyped or marginalized. When trying to understand the complex role of masculinity in the lives of diverse boys and men, it is critical to acknowledge that gender is a non-binary construct that is distinct from, although interrelated to, sexual orientation. Expression of romantic or sexual attraction might present gay, bisexual, transgender, and gender non-conforming individuals with gender role-related conflict that is, in part, born from violations of heteronormative gender role ideals and potentially alienate sexual and gender minority men from a complete male identity. Additionally, some sexual and gender minority individuals do not wish to label their gender identity and do not feel masculine behaviors are an essential component of male gender identity. Wow, that was a lot. They're really squeezing a bunch of different identity politics ideas all together there. Not sure word salad even begins to fully describe all of that stuff. Also, I feel like this is one of those life-comes-at-you-fast moments where this thing was just talking about masculinity being something that gender minorities and other such groups felt excluded from, and now it's making stereotypical comments about such groups not only violating such role ideals, but eschewing masculinity as an identity altogether. Are they excluded from it, or are they flagrantly disregarding it and proclaiming that it doesn't reflect them? It can't really be both. I guess unless you're acting like these different minority groups just have a bad case of sour grapes and are disregarding these masculinity norms just to spite the man. But that's a little condescending to assume, don't you think? I'll be honest with you, with them doing all of this weird pretzeling around different identity groups and trying to assert whether or not masculinity fully applies to each of them, I feel like I've lost the plot several different times trying to read this paragraph. Because yes, most of it has fallen into one mere paragraph. It's like they've forgotten that they were writing what was supposed to be guidelines for how to work with men and boys, and they just had a squirrel moment with identity politics. The problem is, well, actually, there are several problems. <laughs> the first is that even amongst the different groups they have mentioned, each of them yet again will have different experiences of masculinity or their preference for masculine behaviors. A gay man who looks like this, for example, may indeed not be considered especially masculine or may not hold masculine behaviors as being paramount in his relationships, 
but a gay man who looks like this may feel a little differently. This doesn't mean that both of them aren't still gay men. The next problem is related, in that making assumptions about how someone acts or how someone views masculinity based on their external characteristics or specific identity categories means that you are stepping into the counseling room with a bias, which means that you may be more likely to make mistakes. For all you know, these two men may in fact hold levels of masculine attitudes that are completely opposite to what you might expect. And the last problem I want to mention here is, this entire conversation we've just had about the subject becomes essentially a moot point if one of these men walks into the counseling room and says, I'm here to talk about managing my problems with anxiety. I'm not saying that it's impossible that masculinity issues may not play into such a problem, but I am saying that the average client is going to look at you like you've lost your marbles if you make that your primary focus right off the bat. The problem is, this guideline has provided very little in the way of actual, tangible, well, guidelines for working with men and boys as a whole, even just around the mere topic of masculinity as opposed to the dozens of other more likely struggles men might bring to the counseling room. Let's see if they change that in the next paragraph. Spoiler alert, they don't. Although the cultural and societal pressures to endorse, conform to, and perform dominant masculinity are considerable, men still have agency and can part from dominant ideals. Is it just me, or does the sentence really sound like they're implying this should be some sort of goal? Men not meeting dominant expectations often create their own communities within which they develop cultural standards, norms, and values that may depart from dominant masculinity. For instance, in racial and ethnic, youth or gay communities, boys and men may develop forms of resistance in action and attitudes that challenge the expectations of dominant masculinity, such as that of the cool pose of African-American men or the engagement of John Henryism working harder, behaviors identified among African-American adult men. Uh, working harder. Definitely not a behavior typically associated with masculinity, right? Also, just for amusement's sake, I looked up black men cool pose, and I just had to laugh at the absurdity of it, because it seemed like such an utter non sequitur. I looked up the authors that referenced said pose and found this book cover, though, so I guess this is their idea of showing it to the man, or not showing it to the man, or something? Man, am I confused. Anyway, the rest of this paragraph is just talking more about marginalized groups being pressured to conform to masculinity in various ways and is yet again providing no concrete information on how to actually help men in need. So let's skip down to the application section and see if that has some answers for us. Psychologists are encouraged to expand their knowledge about diverse masculinities and to help boys and men and those who have contact with them. Parents, teachers, coaches, religious leaders, and other community figures to become aware of how masculinity is defined in the context of their life circumstances. Wow, gloves off. They really are just telling us to go for it with this topic, huh? I've been feeling so depressed. I need help. But have you considered how masculinity might be factoring into it? Man, piss off. I'm just going to read the rest of this paragraph and then offer my critique at the end. Psychologists aspire to help boys and men over their lifetimes navigate restrictive definitions of masculinity and create their own concepts of what it means to be male, although it should be emphasized that expression of masculine gender norms may not be seen as essential for those who hold a male gender identity. For others, masculinity may function as a means to avoid further marginalization. Clinicians may explore the importance and perceptions of masculinity in minority populations to obtain a better understanding of gender expression across various intersecting identities. Toward that end, psychologists strive to understand their own assumptions of and counter-transference reactions toward boys, men, and masculinity. Psychologists can also explore what being a man means with those they serve. 
Further, psychologists may utilize available assessment instruments to help boys and men discover the benefits and costs of their gendered social learning, as well as measures of gender role conflict. Ugh, this entire section. This is what it looks like when you go into therapy sessions with an agenda. Anyone who follows this guideline is going to go into a room with a man and make an assumption. That assumption is that the thing they need to be focusing on in session is how a man's masculinity contributes to whatever problem he is coming to see a therapist about. Never mind the fact that masculinity is a concept potentially, and even likely, never crossed his mind. That's what we're now focusing on. And it's cute how they throw in the section there about being aware of one's own assumptions about boys, men, and masculinity. I'm not quite sure if I have ever seen someone miss the mark quite so hard. This entire section talks about masculinity as though it's some kind of prison, a confine that simultaneously limits men's experiences while excluding other men who don't quite fit the mold. It assumes that masculinity is a problem to be overcome, a likely contributor to many of the hapless male client's problems. There's no discussion about how masculinity can positively contribute to one's life, or of how it may serve as a protective factor, or as a source of inspiration. To that end, let me end this video with a little bit of an antidote to the attitudes we've seen on display here. In my own sessions, again, inasmuch as masculinity has almost never been a direct subject of discussion, I thought it might be nice to share some of my own experiences seeing what might be called masculine themes in men. I have seen clients who worry that they are not good enough in various respects and who want to improve. I have seen clients who need help to overcome significant mental and emotional challenges in order to continue doing the things they love. I have seen men talk of persevering in the face of many different kinds of abuses, many times without even holding a grudge towards their abuser. And possibly more common than anything else, I have seen men who want nothing more than to help and care for those around them, to be able to heal themselves so that they can be better for those they love. These examples, to me, far better encapsulate the kind of masculinity I see on a regular basis. A masculinity that pushes one to improve, to overcome, to persevere, to help, to care for others. It's at once beautiful and moving and inspiring. It's why seeing messages like those in this first guideline are so profoundly offensive to me, and why I want to stand up and challenge them whenever I can. And noting that this entire video encompasses just one of ten guidelines that are meant to help men and boys, you can bet that we have a great deal yet left to challenge. Thanks so much for watching, and I hope to see you all in the next one.